So I have here some plastic cups. I want to show them to you. I want you to look closely. Can you tell them apart? Does any one stand out? Does any of them, do any of them look different from the other one? No. No, they're all alike. This would illustrate the opposite of the word holiness. Holy means that something stands out, is distinct, separate, other than, um, unusual from anything else. So that, I'm going to use this to illustrate. Does this stand out from these? Can you see a difference right away? Is it immediate? Yes. So this is to help us, a, a, a poor illustration to be sure, but to help us to try to grasp this concept of the whole holiness and what it means to be holy. The word actually means separate, set apart, different, distinct, unusual, not like anything else. That's what the word means. And when it's, of course, applied to God, God is separate, distinct, unusual in that uh, he, his character is pure and his character is, is ethical and he makes no mistakes and he is perfect. And so we're going to be talking today about the holiness of God and we need to understand it because God says in the Old Testament and the New Testament, be holy as I am holy. And so we need to know what it means to be holy, different, distinct, unusual, not like our culture because that is commanded by God. Well, I'm glad you're here with us today. Again, welcome to Bible study, and it is time for our popular quiz. So take your prayer request form and turn it over and number at one to three, and then a bonus question. I know you love these, and it's the only reason you come. And so we will keep having them, <laughs> our popular quiz. All right, number one, it's two different words, so you can write one word, slash, and then the other word. So here's number one. Isaiah was, make sure you have no answers or charts or information or cheat sheets, nothing. Show me your hands, nothing written on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah was commissioned in the year that a king died. Which king was that? And what did that king die from? Isaiah was commissioned in a year that a king died. Which king? And what did that king die from? And as I mentioned before, these pop quizzes will be on not a review of last week's lesson, but what you would have studied during the week, even if you uh, just read through the text a number of times. I uh, just want to encourage you to how much you can learn just reading through the text. All right, the second one is true or false. Uh, most of the nation of Judah will respond positively to Isaiah's message. True or false? Most of the nation of, of, of Judah will respond positively to Isaiah's message. Number three, what kind of angel did Isaiah see in a vision? There's different types of angels. Which type did he see? What kind of angel did Isaiah, Isaiah see in the vision that we studied for today? And then the bonus question is another true or false. True or false. Since I am teaching through Isaiah verse by verse, there's no need for you to do any homework. <laughs> well, as you probably have noticed already, I am teaching verse by verse through Isaiah so that with the Lord's help, we can all understand the book of Isaiah, but your homework has a lot of background material and cross-references and fill in, fills in a lot of um, history and is very important so a lot of things we're not going to have time to go over here during the teaching so as much as you can do it remember we said it's not about getting it all done it's about studying your Bible and this study uh, precept study is a great tool for that and so hopefully you are learning a lot and enjoying that well just to quickly review where we've been in Isaiah 1 through 5 uh, Isaiah 1, we know that Isaiah, oh, I didn't go over the quiz answers. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. What am I thinking? Because we have large prizes for everybody that got them right. <laughs> All right, number one, Isaiah was commissioned in the year the king died. Which king? And what did he die from? Which king? Uh, Uzziah. And what did he die from? Uh, Absolutely. True or false, most of the nation of Judah will respond positively to Isaiah's message. False. false. What kind of angel did Isaiah see in, uh, in his vision? 
Mm-hmm. And true or false, since I'm teaching verse by verse, you don't need to do any homework. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Again, without any pride or arrogance, just smile at me if you got some of those right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we're ready. All right. So Isaiah 1, as a way of review, we learned that Isaiah received visions from the Lord during the reigns of four kings, and they were Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And those were all related, father, son, as were all the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. And the Lord gave him visions concerning Judah, the southern nation, and Jerusalem, the capital of the southern nation. And we learned that God's people had despised and abandoned the Lord, and so God would no longer listen to them. They were called to repentance, but they would not. However, God promised a future restoration and redemption for those who would repent. Isaiah 2 is about the future, and we learned that Jerusalem will someday, during the millennial kingdom, that's after the tribulation, so that's at least uh, seven years away, at least, um, that people will will throng to Jerusalem. All the nations will come to hear about God and his law and his word. And in that day, the Lord alone will be exalted. Isaiah 3 tells us that God is going to remove from Judah and Jerusalem all the supports that they were looking to instead of him. He was going to take them away because they were not looking to him. They were looking to other things. And Isaiah 4 is, again, future restoration and how that God will... um, bring uh, Israel back to himself, and he will protect Jerusalem. We've read about all the different ways Jerusalem will be protected, again, during the Millennial Kingdom and the Eternal (coughs) Kingdom. Isaiah 5 starts with a song that Isaiah sang about his beloved, and the Lord is his beloved, and the Lord planted and cared for the vineyard, and then the vineyard did not produce righteousness. Instead, they produced violence and pride and arrogance and uh, rejection of the Lord. So he pronounced, the Lord pronounced six woes on them and told them that they would be going into exile because of their lack of knowledge and because they despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. So that kind of brings us up to date to where we are to begin Isaiah chapter 6 today. Um, Let's just start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your word. You know what each of us needs to hear. We can do nothing without you, so we look to you to speak to us and to teach us and to help us to apply your truths. Uh, Thank you that you are here with us and that you will help us. And we pray all this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So look at your um, lesson for today on page 37. 37 of your lesson is where we are, and they've got the two charts, and you see that top chart there always gives a timeline, and you see it has an arrow uh, pointing down to 739, and it says 61 at the top of that chart. That means Isaiah 61. It tells us where we are today uh, on the timeline and what this is about. So when you look at the chart below at the prophetic points of history, which is the same as the large chart over there, most of what we're going to study is in the prophet's own time. So chapter 6 takes place, most of it, during Isaiah's lifetime. But we're going to see some of it is going to be future prophecy, and that will be about the captivity. So um, on your chart there on that page, under uh, captivity of seven, 70 years, some of that's going to happen. Just a little bit of it at the end is going to deal with that. And there is just a little uh, word of hope about future restoration, which, of course, the final restoration is going to happen after the tribulation during that Christ's second coming during the millennium and the reign of Christ. So that's where we're going as far as the timeline as we work through this. Well, as you know, this chapter starts with talking about King Uzziah, and it was in the year that King Uzziah died that Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne. So I want to talk a little bit about Uzziah. I um, mean, you had a lot of background material, some verses to look up in your lesson. And that would have been on starting on uh, page 39 in your workbooks there, number two. You have 2 Chronicles 26, and to look up and find out some things about Uzziah and then his son and the nation uh, going on to the, the other pages there. But we learned that Uzziah was a, a good king. He was a strong king. He did what was right in God's sight. Uh, under him, Judah was strong and prosperous and successful, 
and therein was the temptation. As that happened, Uzziah became proud and arrogant. He forgot where his success came from. He acted corruptly. He went into the temple, again in Jerusalem, to burn incense on the golden altar before the Lord. And only the priests were allowed to do that. He did not have access, uh, not being a priest, he was the king, but he was not a priest. He did not have access to go in and burn incense. The interesting thing is that we do have access to go to the Lord. Uh, on one of the uh, verses you had to look up was Hebrews 10, uh, which tells us that we are now forgiven and we have confident access to that holy place where uh, Uzziah was not allowed. We come with confidence to the throne, to the, the holy place, and that's because of the cross. Because of Jesus dying on the cross, we have that access to come near to the Holy One, which Uzziah did not have at that time. So uh, did Uzziah know that he should not have done that? He should not have gone in and tried to burn incense. Well, uh, you had some verses on page 42 of your workbook, uh, Deuteronomy 17 and Leviticus 10, where he probably did know he was not supposed to do that, and for sure, when all those 80 priests came and tried to stop him, he knew at that point it was not a good idea. But he, we don't see any repentance on his part. We don't see any remorse uh, recorded. But because he, up till then, had been a good king, all the kings were commanded by God to write out a copy of the, of the law for themselves and have this copy. So if he had done that, he was called a good king, he would have copied these verses from Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and he would have known only the priests were allowed to go and offer that incense. He probably had his own copy. So he was instantly uh, struck with leprosy, and that's what he died of, and then he kind of had a co-reigning with his son uh, because he was not able to reign. But this was the end of an era. Uh, from Jerusalem, Judah being again prosperous and wealthy and a time of peace. We're going to see um, now after his death that things, um, the Assyrians start coming in and attacking and that's going to get worse and worse and we'll see that in our next lesson. The, the problems and the, the, uh, the, the, the wars and the um, attacks that start happening. But the death of Uzziah was kind of the end of an era there. So he had leprosy, his son Jotham reigned in his place, and Jotham was a good king, but we read um, that the people, the nation, uh, were acting corruptly. So near the end of Uzziah's reign, uh, he, he was kind of a passive king, and of course he had sinned, and so kind of led the people in a way into not having their, the fervor and the, the zeal and obedience to God that he, as king he could have, he could have done that. And uh, so we're going to be seeing Assyria becoming a threat um, at this time. All right, so take your observation sheet, not nearly as many this time as some weeks, and your observation sheets are for chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6. And we're going to learn about the commissioning of Isaiah. He's commissioned by the Lord. So this is... Uh, chapter 6 uh, gives us a peek into the preparation of Isaiah to be a prophet. and this, uh, He would proclaim coming judgment, and he would issue this warning and proclaim this judgment that was to come, and he's going to proclaim it over and over and over. Most commentators, or many at least, believe that chapter 6 happened first, that Isaiah had this vision of God in the temple, high and lifted up, and he uh, received this commissioning, and then he began prophesying, and that's chapters 1 through 5. So a lot of Isaiah is not in chronological order, uh, so I don't know for sure, but that makes sense that he had the commissioning first, and then he began to prophesy. So probably we're looking today at what happened first. So Isaiah 6 is of central importance for the message of the entire book because it is Isaiah's call to be a prophet. Uh, in this vision, as we're going to see, that was revealed by God, about God, of God, he's going to get such a sense of the holiness of God and awe for God and reverence for God that that is really going to motivate him for his people. And he's going to be filled with passion and fervor in spreading his mes message 
and also such a sense of grieving for the people when they do not respond. So this chapter 6 is very central and pivotal uh, for the whole book of Isaiah. And then the chapter theme is something like Isaiah sees the Lord, he is cleansed and sent. Isaiah sees the Lord, he is cleansed and sent. He sent out as a prophet to deliver this message. All right, we get into Isaiah on your sheet there, Isaiah 6.1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, we already talked about King Uzziah. He uh, reigned for about 50 or 52 years. He started when he was 16 years old, so a long reign there, 50, between 50 and 52 years. Uh, he died in 739 B.C. We already look at that on our charts. We know about where we're talking, 739 B.C. We know when it says his death, we know that he died of leprosy. We're going to see a big contrast right here in the first line. We see a king dying, a king that the people... So these angels are continuously crying out to one another. So you think of they're delighting in worshiping God together. Should we do that? Delight in worshiping with others? Well, they are delighting. They're calling out to one another. They're, they're delighting in, in doing this together and worshiping together. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And you see the word holy there used three times. In Hebrew, you've probably heard that the repetition of a word gives it more emphasis and more significance. And it's the only attribute of God that is stressed like this used three times in a row. Holy, holy, holy. And we talked about holiness um, already, that it, it means distinct, separate, unusual, uh, like none other, and has to do with his character and how ethical he is and how pure he is. Some say that the reason it's used three times um, is indicative of the Trinity. Trinity made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but that's, that's one view, not necessarily true, but uh, there are three in the Trinity and they are all holy, so it could be. Notice Lord of hosts, we have Lord in all caps, so what's the Hebrew word there? Yahweh. Yahweh. The covenant uh, keeping faithful personal God. So there, this is what they praise him for, his holiness, the core of who he is, his holiness. And then the whole earth is full of his glory, means the earth is a display case. The earth displays and indicates the presence of God. And we can learn a lot about God just by looking at the earth, looking at creation, looking at beauty. Uh, looking up at the sky, we can learn a lot about God. It is full of his glory. Of course, uh, that's general revelation. We need the word of God for specific revelation, but the earth is full of the glory of God. Creation reveals a lot of attributes of God. All right, so Isaiah is having this vision, and he's watching uh, the, the seraphim, and he sees the Lord on the throne. And then the foundations, verse 4, of the t of the. Um, Temples start to tremble just from the singing, just from these angels praising God. Do you see that their, their life, the, their existence of these angels is praising and serving, worshiping and obeying. And as they're praising God, the thresholds of the temple just start to shake uh, because of these strong, mighty angels who are praising God. And the temple starts filling with smoke. There's no way we can relate it all to what Isaiah is going through here. But smoke indicates the presence of God and can also indicate judgment that is coming, uh, the wrath of God, um, and there, it's all trembling, uh, the smoke and, the, tr and the, the foundation trembling because of what is to come, the judgment and, and that God is there. Well, as Isaiah takes this in, all of a sudden he, he realizes, as he sees this view, the difference between what he is seeing and the huge contrast between the holiness of God and who he is himself. And in verse 5, then I said, Isaiah, woe is me. We studied woe a lot last week. The word woe means devastation and judgment and lamenting and grieving. Woe is me, Isaiah says, for I am ruined. He really thought he was not going to live. To, to see God like that, to have that experience, he did not think he was going to survive it. He says, woe is me. He is in terror at this glimpse of God. 
Woe is me because I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah probably had the cleanest lips of anyone in Judah, and that is why God chose him to be his prophet, to be his messenger. Uh, but the more we see God, the more we get to know God, the more we realize his character, the more the contrast between who he is and who we are is evident. We cannot compare ourselves with other people and think, well, compared to them, I'm pretty good. Compared to them, well, God's kind of lucky to have me. <laughs> compared to them, yeah, I'm doing all right here. I'm, yeah. But we can't compare ourselves to others. We must compare ourselves to God. And where, where do we find out about God? In his word. So as, as Isaiah has this experience, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Remember, Lord of hosts means Lord of of armies. It's a military term, of a commander of the armies. So Isaiah is broken here. He's just broken. Now, unclean lips uh, doesn't mean they just uh, said a lot of bad words, okay? Unclean lips, what he's really talking about is his whole character, his whole heart condition. What we say comes from our hearts. We know that. We've talked about that a number of times. And in your workbook on page 43, starting with number four. If you want to turn there and look at that, page 43. So number four at the bottom there, you have some verses that talk about our words and our tongues. And everything we say comes from the heart. We say what we say because we want what we want. Whatever we do or say is supposed to represent Christ supposed to glorify God, is supposed to be pleasing to God, but sadly it's not always that way. So in Matthew 12 and 15, some of the verses you looked up there tells us that the things that we say come out of our heart. The heart is the core and essence of who we really are, and we, what comes blurting out of our mouth it reveals who we really are and, and what our desires are and what we want. When we truly want to glorify God and to represent Christ well, what comes out of our mouth is going to be totally different than when we just want our own way uh, or when we're um, you know, all emotional and uh, focused on ourself. I want to read a couple of verses that have to do with our words. Um, they're not in your lesson. You can jot down Ephesians 4.29. Ephesians 4.29. Um, the Bible has so much to say. God has so much to say about our words. All through the Bible, Ephesians 4.29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. That means building others up, strengthening others, according to the need of the moment. What do others need to hear in order to build them up to be more like Christ, to encourage them in the Lord, to help them in their spiritual growth? Those are the kind of things we're supposed to say. And our words are to give grace to those who hear. And then he goes on to say, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Our words can really grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And then in verse 31, Paul goes on to say, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Bitterness, wrath, and anger are things that show up in our words, but they come from the heart. And God says, get rid of it all. But instead, verse 32, be kind to one another, be tenderhearted, and forgive, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. We will never have to forgive anyone more than what God has had to forgive us. And then another verse you can jot down there is Colossians 3.17, whatever you do or say. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do or say, represent Christ. So a lot about our words, and so this, we see this here with Isaiah when he says, I am a man of unclean lips, meaning what's coming out of my mouth is, reveals what's in my heart, and my heart is not good. So he is confessing his sin as he has this vision of the holiness of God. 
and he's confessing the sin of his people. So we see humility here and brokenness here as he's having this vision, as he sees the Lord. And again, the more we get to know God, the more broken and humble and submissive and aware of our own sin we should be also. So at, after he confesses his sin, look what happens in verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and this would have been at God's instruction, at God's bidding. One of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And so here we're going to see, uh, uh, so this is symbolic, again, um, Isaiah isn't really in heaven and he's not really going to have his lips touched, but it's all symbolic. Um, he touched, so the seraphim touched my mouth, Isaiah's mouth, with it, with the hot coal, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. So that's immediately his sins are forgiven, he is purified. This is the work of God after Isaiah confessed his sin. So when, what provided forgiveness for Isaiah's sin? Was it this, the, this coal that, that it was magic and somehow as it touched his lips took away his sin? The only thing that has ever provided forgiveness for sin is Jesus' death on the cross. So Jesus, this, you know, it's very likely Isaiah is seeing Jesus on the throne. Jesus had not died on the cross yet because when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for all the sins of the Old Testament from time beginning and uh, for all the future, for all who come to him. So that's how Isaiah's sins were truly going to be forgiven. So it's looking forward to the cross. It's symbolic of what's going to happen at the cross. So he confesses his sin. He, is, he repents of it. He is purified and cleansed. And then he's ready for the next step. Verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord, what's the Hebrew word there? Adonai, saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now, is God up there saying, hmm, what am I going to do now? Anybody got an idea? <laughs> who shall we send? <laughs> Isaiah is now ready. He was so humbled and grieved over his sin and his view of God and this interaction with God. And he is broken and he confesses his sin and he is cleansed and he is ready to serve God. And that's how it should be with us. When we realize the extent of what God has done for us and our sins have been forgiven, we should be ready to serve God. So when God says, whom shall I send? This is, he's given Isaiah an opportunity here. Notice, whom shall I send and who will go for us? There's the Trinity, the three in one. Who will go for us? Who will serve us? Who will be our messenger? Then I said, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. The Lord has something for each of us to do. He has a purpose and a plan using the gifts he's given us, the experiences he's allowed us to go through, the training available, uh, our personalities and temperaments and backgrounds. He has something for each of us to do. Notice Isaiah did not have to be begged or forced or co coerced. Did Isaiah know at this point what it is he's supposed to do? No. <laughs> God doesn't say, okay, this and this and this and this. What do you think? Does that sound like a good fit? Does it sound like something you want to do? Think about it. <laughs> no, he just says, whom shall I send? And without even knowing what it's going to entail, I say, oh, send me. Here am I, send me. His love for God, his, his zeal and desire to serve, just whatever it is, Lord, whatever it is, that should be all right. Whatever you have for me, Lord, use me. Um, very willing, very excited about serving God, even though he didn't know what it would entail. All right, then in verse 9, he starts to find out. God said, go and tell, so it's going to be a speaking ministry, go and tell this people. Now, before God had talked about my people, here he calls them this people. Is it the same people? Yes. It is the same people. <laughs> 
But we're heading now into this proclamation of judgment to come. So it's this people. They're still his people. They'll always be his people, but he's making a distinction here as far as what's going to happen. Go and tell this people. Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. So what God is telling Isaiah here, you're to go and you're to proclaim judgment and warn them and tell them exactly what's going to happen, but their hearts are going to harden. They are not going to understand. They are not going to respond in a good way, and they're going to reject your message. And we see in the Bible a number of cases where God gives people warnings, and he's patient, and he sends more warnings, and he lets them know what's going to happen. And in this case, hundreds and hundreds of years have gone by of warning. And now it's time for judgment. And so they're, they're, um, they're not going to be allowed to, at this point, hear and understand because it's time for judgment. God has decided, time for judgment. So Isaiah's called here to be faithful, to keep doing it, but he's not going to be fruitful. People are not going to respond. You might want to jot down Romans 9, 18 and 2 Thessalonians 2, 11. Romans 9, 18 says, talking about God, so then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. Talking about God. God is the creator. This is his universe. He does what he uh, knows is best, and his ways are absolutely perfect and righteous and just. And then 2 Thessalonians 2.11 is um, similar. 2 Thessalonians 2.11. All right, so Isaiah is being sent to people who won't listen. He's going to preach to stony soil. But again, they have been warned for centuries and it is now time for judgment. How does this apply to us? Well, we cannot lose our salvation. If you're truly a believer and put your faith in Christ, nothing will ever change that. But we can, we can get hard hearts. And every time we hear the word of God and we hear him telling us to do something and we reject it and we say no and we think we have a better idea or we don't want to do that or we don't believe that is best, our hearts get a little harder. Our hearts get a little harder as we say no and we reject what God is telling us. And our hearts get harder and harder, and it comes a point, God is very patient and gracious, but there comes a point where he says, I'm gonna have to have some, you're gonna have to have some consequences, some discipline. God says, because I love you so much, you've been hardening your heart, there's going to have to be some discipline now. And we see that in Hebrews 12, that discipline. So we have to be very careful. We look at, we look at this account and we think, oh, those terrible people, they hardened their hearts. I would not do that. I would have said, yes, Lord, whatever, yes. But every, very frequently we harden our hearts. There's things we know we should do, and we don't. And we kind of play with the patience and grace of God. Well, this message that uh, Isaiah is, is going to bring, as they hear it over and over, just like with children sometimes, when you tell them the same thing over and over, their hearts get harder and harder, and they're more and more determined not to do it. That's what's going to happen here. And so let's see what that's going to lead to. And there, again, these hardened hearts and their, in, their inability to respond is, is part of God's judgment. They had, they had many, many, many chances. God was very gracious and patient. But now judgment is going to be inevitable. God watches how we hear his word and he watches how we respond, as we see in this case. If you look in your um, workbooks on page 49, page 49, number one, you have some verses there that deal with what we were just talking about. People uh, hearing truth, their hearts being hardened, uh, Jesus speaking in parables so that they, uh, purposely so they would not understand. This is part of the judgment of people not responding, even though they had many chances. Okay, verse 10 now in our notes on our um, observation sheet. Verse 10, uh, God is still talking here. He says, render the hearts of, here it is again, this people, not my people. He still loves them, but there's a distance between them because of their disobedience. Render the hearts of this people 
insensitive. They're not going to be able to comprehend. Their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Again, the day of responding is over. It is now time for judgment. This passage is quoted in all the Gospels and two times by the Apostle Paul uh, in different parables and in different um, um, verses in the New Testament. Again, this, and when there was the failure to have the proper response and in God's timing by his grace, then their hearts are hardened. So at this point, there's no possibility of them turning back, although we do see this remnant. God will always have a remnant. So we know that Isaiah's ministry is going to be very, very difficult and, and very discouraging at times. Look in your workbook on page 50. Page 50. At the bottom, 3B. It says, read John 6.35 and note who it is who comes to Jesus and what happens to them on the last day. And what we learned there, again, this is a, a really um, important uh, theological truth here. Uh, Jesus says, all that the Father gives to him will come. All that the Father gives to Jesus will come to him. And that Jesus will raise him up on the last day. Now, what does that mean? Well, when, we, when a believer dies, your soul goes immediately to be with the Lord. We know that immediately, instantaneously, your soul goes to be with the Lord. But you don't have a body yet. You will get your body later. So there's uh, different phases of the resurrection. Um, the church age gets resurrected at a different time than um, the Old Testament uh, saints get resurrected and, and the tribulation saints. And so there's different times of resurrection. But Jesus will raise up and raise up our bodies later. So I don't want you to read this and think, do I just stay in the ground for a long time? No, your soul instantly goes to be of the Lord. Your body is resurrected. You get that new forever body later. And it doesn't matter whether you were eaten by sharks or torn apart by lions or cremated. God is going to put your body back together. And uh, he, he knows where all those parts are. And you're going to get a new glorified body. But let us see, what is our responsibility to God for the salvation of others? And, and just as we saw here with Isaiah, Isaiah couldn't make the people understand. He couldn't make them repent. But he was responsible for himself to be faithful and obey God and to persevere. That is the same for us. We cannot make people come to the Lord. We see here that people come to the Lord because the Father draws them. And, but that everyone that the Father draws will come. And so our job is to be able to explain the gospel clearly and to pray for opportunities and to pray for courage and to share the gospel. And I truly believe, well, this is true, you know, each day we're getting closer and closer to the time of judgment when people, the rapture is going to occur, all the believers will be taken out. And so we need to make sure our loved ones, our families and neighbors and loved ones the co have heard the gospel. We cannot make them accept the gospel. We cannot force them. That wouldn't do any good anyway. It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. But our job is to be bold and consistent and pray for opportunities to share the gospel. And one of the things you may be doing next week in small group is one of the options um, for the group to do is to, again, talk about what, what is included in a gospel presentation. How can I give a clear presentation of the gospel? Uh, what needs, uh, what, um, how can I explain it to someone in a way that they really understand what it means? But our job is to go and make disciples, and then God does his job as far, his work as far as the results of that. Well, Isaiah hears now what his mission is going to be and that the people are going to have, his, his words are actually going to make their, heart, their hearts harder. It's gonna make them resist all the more. Does he quit? Does he say, can I reconsider? Does he say, this is not what I signed up for? Does he say, find someone else? Does he say, this is going to be too hard? What does he say in verse 11? Then I said, Lord, Adonai, how long? So we don't know for sure if he means how long am I going to um, give this message. Uh, he, may, you know, he just may be wanting some facts and information. Uh, he, maybe he wonders how long are they going to have hard hearts. 
but he does know his ministry is going to be very difficult. And the Lord answers, here's the answer in verse 11. You're going to be giving this message until cities are devastated and without inhabitant. And again, we know some of this happens after Isaiah's death because during Isaiah's lifetime, the northern kingdom was taken away by Assyria. It was, it was 100 years after his death, 100 years or so, that the southern kingdom was taken away by the Babylonians. So they, they are going to have hard hearts until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. That's how long they're going to have hard hearts because they would not repent. <coughs> So the, uh, the whole southern kingdom of Judah is going to collapse because they refuse to listen after many centuries of warnings and prophets and messages. Um, they were still rebellious. So uh, verse 12 is in the future. I said we're going to look a little bit into the future in this chapter. The Lord, uh, Yahweh, has removed men far away. So this has to do with the Assyrians taking the northern and the Babylonians taking the southern. But at, at this time, uh, when Isaiah is having this conversation with the Lord, it had not happened yet. It's looking to the future. This is the prophetic, a prophetic uh, way of talking about it. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it. So a tenth of the people are going to remain. This is probably talking about when Nebuchadnezzar came in, the Babylonians, when he came in in 586 BC, remember that's one of those dates I said, remember 586, it's 722 BC for the northern, 586 BC for the southern, when he came in and destroyed Jerusalem. But there's going to be a tenth left, a, a, a remnant that will be left and not destroyed. But look what's going to happen to them. And from this tenth, it will again be subject to burning. So this tenth that's left, they're going to go through many hard times. But they're not ever going to be totally wiped out. We know that. There are Jews still alive today. And we know that during the tribulation, many thousands of Jews are going to come to Christ. But talking about Isaiah's time and right after Isaiah's time during the time of the Syrians and the Babylonians uh, it's going to get down to not too many people left and then he describes it at like a forest um, where the stumps have been cut down um, and all that remained is a stump that's what's going to remain of the nation like a, a forest that's been cut down but then we have this hope here hope amidst the doom <laughs> The, this promise here, they're like a stump remains when it is felled, but the holy seed is its stump. So here again, we see some hope. We see the promise of restoration. We see a little talk here of the remnant that will be set apart and that God is not finished with Israel. He will never be finished with Israel. And we see in here this glimmer of the promise of the Messiah coming. Um, so I want to just wrap up by talking about some things we learn about Isaiah the man because he didn't write much about himself. He was not about himself. He was t telling about this vision that God gave him. But just some, some points here to remember and learn from Isaiah. He saw the Lord, and that changed him forever. It changed who he was, how he responded to life, um, how he loved the people, and how he gave the message. He was filled with awe and reverence and humility and submission. And probably this vision, which is probably the first thing that happened, is why he used the, to the title Holy One of Israel so many times. Because he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he saw those angels singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. So he is the one that used the term, the Holy One of Israel, 26 times. We don't see it very often used anywhere else in scripture. Again, we are to get to know the Lord better and better as we are in the word of God and it should change us and change our lives and how we respond and how we treat people and how we serve and obey. He had a deep awareness of his own sin. How often do we think of our own sin? How often do we think of ourselves as sinners? How often do we confess our sin? How often do we ask God to forgive us? We see everyone else's sin. Oh, we see that. And we don't understand why they can't see their own sin. Very noticeable. But we see here that when Isaiah had this vision of God, 
it just humbled him and broke him. He was not self-righteous. We can be very self-righteous when we compare ourselves with others. How much of an awareness of our own sin do we have? Do we ask God to reveal our sin? No, not usually. Who wants that? That does not sound like a good time, does it? Asking God to reveal our sin. Because then we know once we're aware of it, we need to do something about it and not just ignore it. He had a profound experience of the grace of God. He didn't beg God for forgiveness. He just said, I'm a man of, un woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the Lord. He's, but he didn't beg for forgiveness. He just confessed his sin and God forgave him and provided a way at the cross for all of his sins to be paid for. We should constantly be so grateful and thankful for the grace of, life, of God in our lives, first of all for our salvation. But he is just pouring out his grace on us constantly every day. And a lot of times we're just so unaware of it. We, we complain, we're negative, we're critical. We just think of ourselves. And God is pouring out his grace on our lives all the time. Isaiah was willing to be spent in the service of God, whatever the cost. Again, he volunteered before he even knew what it would entail. He trusted God. He was full of faith. He was ready to serve uh, even before he knew the details. And then he served, knowing there would be no fruit. How often have you been in a ministry or been trying to serve someone or love someone or be kind to someone, and when you didn't see any response, you said, I'm done. I'm done with that. I tried. Nobody's going to fault me for giving up here. I tried for a week, and uh, it's not working. <laughs> Well, the two most important commands that God gives us are to, to love God and to love others. And he never says in his word there's an, um, a time when we can stop loving. He never says, okay, you've loved enough, I understand, you've really tried, yeah, let's us move on. No, we're always to love and love more and love more. I love God and love others, even if there's no fruit, even if there's no good response, even if whatever ministry God's called us to, we don't see good response or fruit. We do it for the Lord, to glorify him, and with the strength and grace he provides, and leave the results in his hands. Isaiah loved his people, but he spoke hard truth to them because he loved them. There are times when we need to speak hard truth to others. We need to confront. We need to um, speak the truth, but in love. So when I say speak hard truth, it must be gentle. we must be gentle. We must be kind. We must be humble. We must be loving. But don't back off from speaking truth that people need to hear. And when he had to tell them of judgment, he didn't do it with glee. He didn't act like, it's about time. It's about time you suffered some consequences. He was grieved. He was so grieved for what was coming. He was grieved because they we're not living the life they could have if they had lived in obedience. How grieved are we for the lives and sins of others and what they're experiencing, what they will go through if they don't come to Christ or if they don't live for the Lord? We can look at what he said in a couple of verses and learn some things. In verse 5, he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. We already talked about what we learn about him from there. Again, his his humility, his, his realization of in comparison with God who he was. In verse 8, we have some more of his words. He says, here am I, send me. We see a lot about his heart there. And then verse 11, he says, Lord, how long, how long are these people going to have hard hearts? He's very concerned for the people. You learn a lot from his words. From the onset of his ministry, he knows what the end is going to be. Colossal tragedy. Because they heard from his own mouth as he goes around, they heard and yet refused the word of God. So he knew that from the very beginning. But he was faithful. He was not about results or responses. He was faithful to what God called him to do. So as we look at this chapter and the sequence... Don't miss the sequence. King Uzziah died. 
And the timing there is so perfect, as God's timing always is, that as Uzziah died, where people's hopes were, Isaiah has this vision of who God is and where his focus should be and where his hope should come from. And then Isaiah is plunged into self-despair as he has that vision. Self-despair, confession, and then cleansing and forgiveness, and then service. That is a very important sequence there that we can learn from. Well, in this chapter, we see a lot of dying. King Uzziah died. Isaiah thought he was going to die. The nation is going to be devastated. We see these trees that have been all cut down. But we also see hope. God always gives hope. And we know that uh, we learn in other passages of Scripture, get about the, and we'll see in Isaiah, restoration and uh, God bringing his people back. But we keep coming back to Deuteronomy 30. So I want to just close by reading from Deuteronomy 30. And um, we, we've spent some time in your homework in Deuteronomy 28 and the blessings and the curses. And if you do this, you'll get blessing. And if you don't, you'll have all these curses from the Lord. And, um, but then the hope that we want to give is that they'll return to the Lord and obey him with all their heart and soul. And the Lord will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. And if you're outcast or at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you and he will bring you back. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possess and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. So to, that has been partially fulfilled. You know, they were in exile and then they came back into the land, and then they got scattered again in uh, the year 70 by the Roman Empire. They were scattered again and forced out of their land, but then in 1948, they came back into the land. So part of that part has been partially fulfilled, but this part has not. Deuteronomy 36, moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments, which I command you today. That has not happened yet. That has not been fulfilled. But we know it will, and we will be there to watch it happen. If you are a believer in Christ, you will be there. You will see all these Jews coming to Christ, and we will live with them for all eternity as they come back to the Lord, as they believe in Jesus as their Messiah, and love him with all their heart and soul and mind, and as we reign with them, with the Lord for all eternity. What a wonderful future. No matter what's going on in these unprecedented times we are having, we know the end of the story. We know what's going to happen, and we can live in joy and hope as we go and make disciples. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true and absolute, and it is our authority, and it is our hope and instruction and help and guide because the word tells us about Jesus. We thank you for this word of the Lord high and lifted up in all, in all his glory and majesty and holiness. And Lord, help us to become more and more holy, to be like Jesus, because that's what we were created to do. And that is where we find all that we're looking for as we live for you. But we need your help. We ask for your help in that. In Jesus' name, amen.